Hello, world. I'm with my friend Sherman Kong, who runs Maple Leaf Survival. He's going to show us what kind of essential gear would be good to have when you're driving around in the winter. So there's a variety of reasons why, even if you're driving a vehicle, you might end up in a survival situation. It could be blizzard conditions and you just can't drive. It could be that you run out of fuel from waiting too long for the conditions to pass over. It could be that you hit a rut, blow a flat tire, you end up in the ditch. Maybe it's just so cold that for the amount of time that you've left your vehicle, it won't start again. So it's helpful to have a few items in your vehicle that I'll just give you some peace of mind in case anything will happen. It's not a comprehensive list of equipment. So I'll just show you quickly what I carry in my vehicle without kind of going overboard. So I've kind of laid them out for you here. So it's always good to have some type of cutting implement. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. A multi-tool can be very helpful as well. Something that has a variety of tools at your disposal. Something that helps with your manual dexterity if things get cold. I can pinch and grip things a lot better with a pair of uh, pliers than I can with my fingers, especially if they get cold. So a multi-tool is good. There's also a knife on here. Um, a lighter, brightly colored, so if you drop it in the snow, you can easily spot it. The thing about lighters is that, you know, you want to have a couple spread throughout your vehicle, and especially one on your person, um, because when it gets really cold, sometimes these won't start right away. You got to warm them up a bit. What, do you have to warm, warm up your lighter? If it gets really cold, these won't work. Oh. And so sometimes you got to warm them up a little bit. And it doesn't take much, you know, just put them close to your, you know, to your body. Uh, let your body heat warm up the lighter. Um, some people stick them in their armpits. Some people stick them in their mouths, if, uh, believe it or not. If you have inside your cook set some type of metal container, or a bowl or whatnot, um, that allows you a, a, a vessel in which to melt snow. This is just my little car camping cook set plate. This could also be used for signaling. And these are just kind of little saucepans with flip out butterfly handles. I always carry as well this little flip up stove. These have been around for a really long time. They started off um, being included in, I believe, military mess tins. And what you do is you put a little block of fuel in here and then you can put your pot on top of it. So how long will this pack last? Well, each block will last about a good 10 to 12 minutes. And there's several of these blocks in here. They're solid fuel blocks. And so you just hit it with a lighter. And then what you do is you just plop that, that block into this little pocket stove. It's called an Esbit stove. Um, and that will be your fuel source. I imagine you can also put like natural wood and other combustible materials in here. But the nice thing about these is that they're, they're very portable. They don't get in the way. They weigh nothing. Um, and it's a good way to have uh, a fuel source. This device here is handy in case your tire pressure drops a little bit too low in the cold conditions. This one, however, can plug into a cigarette lighter in your vehicle. It's something to help jumpstart your battery. So if, you're, if it gets really cold and your battery dies, uh, having a device like this, of course you need power, um, but it could just simply be in your garage. Uh, and you need something to boost your vehicle if you don't have another one to boost you, this little device can come in handy or, or, or something similar. Because when your car dies and you need to get somewhere, that's a problem. The other thing that comes in really handy is a shovel. And that could be for building a snow shelter. It could even be to dig yourself out if you get stuck in deep snow. Now, a lot of people, when I say shovel, they might be thinking of something big and obtrusive. This is a collapsible shovel. Uh, you might see people snowing in the backcountry with these, um, but it's very lightweight, it's very packable. The handle can be extended so that you get more reach and a little bit more leverage. The other thing that um, you can do with this particular shovel is you can remove the entire handle so that you can make it even more packable. But having a snow shovel in, uh, in, a winter, con in a winter, you know, winter conditions can prove to be extremely handy. The other thing that you can use uh, you know, a shovel for even in, in, you know, in the summertime is if you need to manipulate your fire and you don't want to touch it, uh, you can use a shovel for that. I like to have 
at least some type of heavier cutting implement, like an ax, and you can get them in a variety of different lengths. Having something with a little bit more reach can be useful when you're trying to process larger pieces of wood or you know, tackle with trees uh, and larger limbs. Sometimes having something a little bit shorter could, could, could come in handy if you find yourself in tight spaces and you need a little bit more maneuverability or you need to you know, get under uh, certain spots that are, are hard to access. So I like to have you know, a couple of different options. This one in particular, because it's so small, it's very, it's very out of the way. This is a collapsible buck saw. Sometimes if the snow is really deep, you know, like it is here, it can be kind of dangerous to wield a, an ax. Um, your balance might be compromised, things like that. Um, so sometimes having a saw can be a lot safer. So this particular folding buck saw gives you an ability to take care of wood in a way that's far safer than wielding, wielding an ax in really deep snow where your balance again might be compromised. So how this works is you just extend this frame. As you snap the handle back in, it provides tension. And now what you have is essentially a full-size buck saw. And because there's enough width between the frame and the blade, and it runs the entire length, it allows you to process um, quite large pieces of wood, uh, large diameters of wood. If you really wanted to get crazy, and if your vehicle has, um, you know, the compartments for it, you could outfit your, your vehicle with a little bit more gear. I won't go into all of this, but in here, some of the things I have are, you know, a tarp, candles, hitching ropes, jumper cables, things of that nature. Um, devices to make my vehicle more visible if I'm broken down on the side of the road. However, these basic items, again, it's not an exhaustive list, but having these basic items can really prove to be valuable, come in really handy, get yourself out of a jam. And that's my winter car survival kit. So I've asked uh, Sherman to check out my brother's car to see how he's doing for winter survival. So let's open her up. Okay, let's see what we have here. Well, we have a pair of running shoes. I don't know how useful they will be in a winter survival situation, but I guess you never know. We have some <coughs> receipts. I suppose you could use these for uh, you know, to help start a fire. And it looks like we have some reusable shopping bags. I imagine you could probably hang these from trees if you had trees nearby you to make um, your sight a little bit more visible to people that might be looking for you. Let's see here. Spare tire. That'll come in handy. Tissues. Cloth, some garbage bags, those could certainly be useful. One thing that I might say though is if you did need to change your tire and it was really cold outside, one thing that would be handy is to have an extra set of mitts um, in your vehicle. Because as soon as your hands start getting cold, you start to lose your fine motor skills, your manual dexterity really suffers. And um, you know, in, in really bad situations, that could prove to be fatal. Um, you know, if you don't have the dexterity to do simple things like light a fire, um, manipulate your phone to make, a, to make an emergency phone call, even things like zipping up your jacket. If you drop something in the snow and you gotta go searching for it and your hands are just seized up because they're so, so frigid, um, that can be a real problem. But I mean, the things that we, that we were looking at in my vehicle um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it would be difficult to add those items um, to your brother's vehicle because they won't take up a lot of space. You know, a, a multi-tool, a shovel, an axe or a folding saw, you know, a small pot even 
uh, and a lighter, like those things won't take up a lot of space. And the thing is, if you, if you need to have those items, it's better to have and not need than need and not have. So, um, you know, and you, you never want to think that, you know, something can happen to you because the, the scenarios we were talking about earlier, you know, going off the side of the road, blizzard conditions, running out of gas, flat tire, car won't start. Um, having some basic items in your vehicle really can make all of the difference. And um, you never want to think that it can't happen to you because these type of situations um, are very common, especially in a place like Winnipeg. Um, you know, you could be traveling, you know, to and from your relative's place for the holidays. Having a few items in your vehicle, um, I don't think that can be, you know, emphasized enough. What else is surprised I didn't see in your vehicle was I kind of also imagine those space blankets people have those. I had, yeah, they're in there. There's a variety of things that I do have in my vehicle um, that I didn't really cover, but some of the items that I have are, for instance, like a signal mirror, space blankets, um, hand warmers, um, other little gadgets. They, I wouldn't say are completely essential, but um, having the basic items, I think are very important. Okay, one thing I was surprised is I didn't see any water or food. Yeah, if you have the right equipment to turn snow into liquid water um, and you're in a winter survival situation, you don't really have, I mean, water is kind of all around you, it's just in the form of snow. So if you, if you have something to, you know, manipulate the snow into liquid water, um, then I'm not necessarily, too, myself, I'm not necessarily too worried about it. Yeah, if I was going out and doing something extreme, I might have water with me. Um, the thing about water is that in the world of survival, there's this thing called the rule of threes. And it's just like a helpful mnemonic. So it's like, you know, roughly three seconds to respond to a bad situation. You know, roughly three minutes uh, without air. Roughly... Um, you know, th three minutes in extreme cold water if you were to fall through the ice or something like that. Um, roughly three hours in extreme heat or cold before exposure might get you. Uh, roughly three days without water, roughly three weeks without food. And these are general guidelines. But um, by far the biggest killer in a survival situation is exposure. Again, either from extreme heat or cold. So that would be my primary concern. Um, and so therefore, if I know I can go a little bit longer without water, uh, again, all of this is, depe you know, is dependent on the situation. Um, and then when it comes to food, you can go roughly three weeks without food. So that's kind of the last thing I'm worried about in a survival situation is, is access to food. However, the paradox is when you do need food, it can be very difficult to come, to come by food. So, when you're talking about like foraging for wild edibles and things like that, there's, <laughs> there's really nothing uh, in, in a survival situation in the winter. Uh, we're checking the temperature right now and let's zoom in. Minus 23. Minus 23. That doesn't feel like minus 23 to me. It doesn't feel like minus 23 to me either. And that's because of the wind chill. So if we scroll up a bit, with a 19 kilometer hour wind, it actually feels like minus 34. Yeah, I could say that. Like, yeah. I was okay for the first few minutes of filming here, but uh, my hands, I don't know if I can feel them anymore. And say it was my toes, so I'm kind of worried about tomorrow's shoot. Yeah, my, my, my feet are fine, but my hands are starting to get really cold. Okay, well then put the phone away. <laughs> okay. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Peace.